Oh, if you've been blessed, say amen. amen. You know, that's the, one of the multifaceted beauties and blessings of being in a fellowship that's led by the Spirit and not by personalities or programs. God just customizes the services. He knows exactly what you needed before you got here, and he ordered the steps of the parries and put it on Pastor Mike and mine's heart to, to make this day the day they'd be here. And, and somebody, somebody needed a day, amen? Just to be reminded, this whole crazy world's not our home. Thank you to the Perrys. Christy and I had the privilege of being uh, Libby and Tracy and Jared, uh, their son. I had the privilege of being their pastor for a number of years. And uh, what you see on this platform in her life is exactly who she is, uh, regardless of where you meet her. She, they just love the Lord. They walk in the Spirit, and um, they're not performers. Uh, they're ministers of the gospel. And I can't wait to see Tracy Stuffle. If you never got to meet him, you missed a, You sure enough missed the character. Uh, he sure brought a lot of color to this world. Take your copy of God's Word, if you would, please. And I want you to go over to Hebrews chapter 11. We are in a series that uh, on the surface, dealing with uh, the biblical doctrine of faith, it seems uh, rudimentary. It seems elementary. Uh, faith is such a basic component of the believer's life that one of the challenges is that when we approach the matter of faith, we have uh, unpacked it, heard about it, uh, if I could say it this way, we've, we've been exposed to it secondhand in some situations, so much so that it, it, we, we tend to lessen the expectancy of learning anything else about faith. Now, let me tell you why faith is, in, is absolutely one of the most essential components of a victorious Christian life. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, I want you to hold on to uh, uh, Hebrews 11, verses 1, 2, and 3. We're going to set the tenor and the tone uh, from that reading in just a moment. But you'll, you'll know this. We, according to he Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and following, we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves that we should boast. And then it goes on to say, not only are we saved by grace, grace meaning that you can't earn it, you can't buy it, you, 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 you can't be good enough, long enough to get it. Grace, grace gives you what you don't deserve. Mercy withholds what you do deserve. I deserve death, hell, and the grave. Mercy withheld that penalty. Grace, not only did mercy withhold it, grace gave me eternal life in Jesus Christ. So by grace... I am saved. If you're here this morning, perhaps under the erroneous idea that you got to be good enough, long enough, give enough, go enough, teach enough, tithe enough in order to get to heaven, you have bought into a satanic deception. You can never be good enough. You, I, I had a fellow said to me not long ago that visited our church one time, and uh, he I made a statement that he just vehemently disagreed with. He said, I, I just, I, I think that you said in during the baptismal service, preacher, you said that, you know, baptism doesn't save us. We don't have to be baptized to be saved. That's exactly what I said, and I'm not retreating from that. You, you are not baptized to be saved. You're baptized because you are saved. Baptism is not the act of being saved. It's the declaration publicly that not only are you born again, but you are becoming, you're dying to yourself, uh, and, and you're being raised to the fullness of all God has for you. And he was adamant. He, he was adamant that you, if you're not baptized, you're not saved. Well, here's the problem. The problem is that's wrong. It's just wrong. It's just wrong, and here's the, here's the deal. There was, a, there was a thief on the cross that died on the same day Christ did, and he, he listen, he, did, he was, went up on that cross a criminal, deserved the death he got. He confessed Jesus Christ. He said, remember me when you get to your kingdom. That is a confession of faith. He didn't come off that cross and get baptized. He didn't join a Baptist church. He didn't walk an aisle, sign a card. He didn't tithe. He didn't teach. He did none of that. Jesus said to him, today you will be with me. Not when you go through the baptistry, not when you get to the Baptist church, not when you learn how to tithe or teach. He said today, because what I'm doing on this cross settles it all. I'm saved by grace, by grace through faith. Now that word through, it, it indicates that there's an ongoing process. Faith is the fuel of, of the Christian life. Now you could get saved. You, you get saved this morning. You, 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 you could confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior 
and step out of hell and have the hope of heaven with your name written in the Lamb's book of life, but live a miserable existence between the confession of Christ and the departure of this life. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? So when you get to faith, it, it, sometimes we, we don't understand the essence of it, the importance of it. We don't understand how absolutely essential. So when you preach on faith, it we, we look at it with less of an expectancy to really walk off with anything profound. Let me see if I can illustrate this for you before we get to the text. Uh, you perhaps uh, heard about this recently uh, in our nation's capital. One of our senators uh, had uh, stayed late in a legislative session and um, uh, got into the wee hours of the night, actually the early hours of the morning, and he made his way out of the Capitol and was making his way down one of those dark alleys in Washington, which is not known for its security or its intelligence, but that's another statement. And uh, <laughs> he was weaving his way through the streets, and uh, out of nowhere, out of nowhere in the darkness, uh, this armed bandit, this young man with a mask on, stepped out and put a gun in, in, in the senator's face, and he said, hey, buddy, this is a stick-up. I want your watch, I want that ring, and I want your money. And, and the senator trying to negotiate with him said, son, you, you, you don't want to do this. You, you really don't want to go down this path. He said, listen, I'm going to tell you one more time. And he pulled the hammer back on that gun. He said, I want your watch, I want your ring, and I want all your money. And the senator said, son, you don't, you don't even know who you're talking to. He said, I am a United States senator. He said, oh, in that case, I want my money. <laughs> See, you knew, you, you, thought you knew exactly where that was going. Now, I want you to help me out a little bit here. Help me out a little bit here. Um, it, 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 not only by faith are we saved, but the, the, but the Bible says without faith it is impossible. Not, not, not unlikely, not highly improbable. It is impossible to please God. Yeah. Uh, that which is not of faith is sin. Um, you you, you got to remember this. You, you and I, when we got saved, remember we got saved by grace through faith. We didn't even get saved with the faith that we had. In fact, I suspect it's already happened in this room, perhaps through the, the, the medium and the means of the camera. Somebody sitting there and, and they're grappling right now. They think, they think it's an emotion. They think it's, it's the music or the message. No, it's not. I'm telling you the miracle of saving faith is this. It's not even our faith. The Holy Spirit of God will come to you and invite you to come by faith that you didn't even have. He'll give you the faith to believe. And in that moment, you listen, we're not talking about some prissy, nice little white angel. Anglo-Saxon Jesus hanging on a smooth tree. We're talking about the Son of God wrapped in bone and sinew, beaten beyond recognition, stripped naked, hanging in the balance. The midday became midnight. The earth convulsed. Angels wept. Jesus died, became the sin that I am, that I might by faith respond to the wooing of the Holy Spirit of God. So why is this element of faith so absolutely integral? In, why is it essential? Because uh, apart from faith, apart from it, not only can you not please God, but I, I am convinced biblically, apart from faith, you'll never see the fullness of all that God can do. You are not simply saved to sit, soak, and sour. You are not simply saved in order to get out of hell. In fact, it is my growing conviction that the affection of the father when he, when he killed the son, when that is literally what Isaiah said, he was smitten of the son. It is, the primary objective was not to get Jeff out of hell. It was that God the father through some infinite love decided that he wanted Jeff in heaven, but he, Jeff couldn't go the way he was, so he sent his son to become who I am that I might become who they are. D d does that not boggle your mind? Well... We talked a couple of weeks ago about the, the, uh, the definition, if I could say it that way. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. If you're there, say amen. Hebrews chapter, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen we're not made of things which are uh, visible. I love the way that um, Warren Wiersbe commentates on this particular verse. He says it this way, that Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 and following is not a definition of faith, but it's a description of the operation of faith. In fact, we'd be hard-pressed in the Word of God to really hone in on one particular place 
where you could say this is a definition of faith. Um, this is the operation of faith. And one of the mysteries of living the Christian life is that faith is not a step into the darkness. It, it's a walk in the light. Does that make sense? So that you come to the word of God. The word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It is, it is very specific in the Hebrew. Lamp, which gives me a read on the current situation. Light gives me um, revelation on my direction. The lamp of his word keeps my immediate step and the light of his word prevents me or permits me to continue to walk in the revelation of who he is. Now, having said that, because we spent a lot of time on that particular operation and definition of faith, I want to share with you ever so quickly, we're, we're going to uh, build and next week we're coming to the crescendo of the application of faith. Now, if we've looked at uh, the definition as it were, then we're going to look today at the operation of faith. And here's, here's my motivation. Here's my challenge this morning. I, I don't want you to get lost in uh, the focus of, of, of faith to believe God for something. I, I want you to look at biblical faith as a deeper intimacy in knowing God. Let me see if I can say it this way. The enemy is a master counterfeiter. Do you understand that? He is a master counter. He can appear as an angel of light. He only counterfeits that which is of, of intrinsic eternal value. You, you, don't, you don't counterfeit dollar bills. You're going to counterfeit something and you're going to take the chance to go to jail. You're going to counterfeit 50 and above. Can I get a witness, right? Why? Because a dollar's worth about a dime right now. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're not, you're not going to take a chance. He's the same way. He has, he has an understanding. It, 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 uh, Dr. Billy Graham was over in Europe preaching. His wife got to accompany him uh, at this particular trip, Ruth, and she was seated uh, at this massive banquet table. She was seated next to the chief inspector of the Scotland Yard, uh, one of the most accomplished law enforcement officers in the world. And they began to discuss what he did specifically as the chief uh, officer for Scotland Yard. And he said, well, my expertise is uh, counterfeiting. I, I uh, police, I oversee the counterfeit department uh, because it's, you know, people are always count, uh, counterfeiting the money. And she said to him by her own testimony, she said, well, you must have to study a thousand different ways that people counterfeit money. And he said, no, not at all. I only have to study the original. Because in knowing the original, I can immediately spot the fake. That's what faith does. Faith just simply brings you into an intimacy of the authentic, and it gives you a, an awareness that there's something off here. Let me, let me show you how easy this is for the enemy to, to skew us, to keep us from exercising the fullness of what faith can do. Uh, there is, um, in, in our particular evangelical circles, you almost never hear anybody preach on the biblical doctrine of prosperity. In fact, if you'll pause, you'll feel the room tighten up a little bit. <laughs> they, are, they are pulling up my web, uh, pulling up my email address to begin to text me right now. Now listen to me. There is a biblical doctrine of prosperity in this book. But here's, here's the problem. It's been perverted just enough in fact, this is what they'll say. I get so ticked at them. If you'll send me a hundred, God will send you a thousand. I want to email them suckers and say, you send me a thousand, God send you ten, right? I mean, Goober Gump, I, Helen Keller could see something's wrong with this picture. You understand what I'm saying? So what happens is we recoil, we back up a little bit, we walk away and we say, whoa, we don't want to hear anything about the doctrine of prosperity. Listen to me very carefully. There is a doctrine of prosperity that, that teaches that your father will withhold no good thing from you. Now, your good thing may not be my good thing because God knows if I get enough good things, I may not depend on him because I got too many things. I live in Halls, Tennessee. Do y'all know where Halls is at? We have it. Ask them. Halls has it. We don't know what it is yet, but we have it. Halls has it. That's what they said. We're hoping for a vaccine to cure it, whatever it is. I don't know. <laughs> let, let me tell you, let me tell you the, that I, I've been here seven years. Let me tell you the number one business in halls, the number one business in halls. We have more storage companies in halls 
than anywhere in the United States of America. I don't know that officially, but I feel it in my spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? I said to my wife, that they, 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 they were tearing up some ground the other day. And uh, my, uh, I said to my wife, I'm not even going to ask what they're building. It's a storage place, I guarantee you. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Because we got so much stuff that we have nowhere to put our stuff, so we have to go rent room from people so we can put our stuff so we can go buy more stuff to put in. If stuff could figure, if stuff could solve the problems of the world, halls would have no problems. Do you understand? We would be nirvana. Do you understand what I'm saying? So your good thing is not my good thing. So the doctrine of prosperity is not, it's not getting more. It's trusting that the father knows what you have need of. So when it comes to the substance of faith, that's what I stand on because the text says in verse 3 that he framed the world by his word. So for some of us, the challenge of believing God, faith and belief are synonymous, believing God. I'm going to show you in a text just in a moment how this, how this plays out. For some of us, uh, we, we're not believing God for, you know, uh, for this monumental mounting of healing today. We're not up against this mammoth, unbelievable, demonic infiltration. That's not what I'm talking about faith that believes that that indifferent, cold-hearted husband can have a touch of God. Y'all the holiest people I've preached to all week long. I'm talking about faith that can look at a child that has no interest in the things of God, that's been beguiled by the world, that wants nothing to do with the, with the eternal vision God has for his life. I'm talking about faith that believes that God can still rescue the prodigal, can still set the alcoholic free, can still bring the indifferent into an intimate relationship with him. This is not just pie in the sky, name it and claim it. This is the capacity to say God didn't just save me in order to deliver me to heaven. He, he saved me in order to bring heaven into me so that on my way home, I can make an impact. Now, let's, let's, let's get to the operation of faith. Let's get to the operation. And what I want you to do is I want you to take your copy of God's Word and I want you to go over to, to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 is going to illustrate the biblical truth that we just looked at out of um, Hebrews chapter 11. If faith is essential, without it we can't please God, that which is not a faith is um, of sin, then how essential is it for us to have this kind of faith in our life. We're gonna, we're in just a minute, we're going to focus on Mark chapter 5, and we're going to begin our reading at a very familiar place, Mark chapter 25. But before we get there, Mark 5, verse 25. Before we get there, I'm, I'm going to set, set the, the, the stage for you. After I came to Christ, um, on into my walk with the Lord, I began to notice that there were these folks that were um, they were different. Even in the church, there was something characteristic on them that set them apart even from other professing believers. They could walk in a room and the atmosphere would shift. Now, I'm not being mystical. I'm just telling you they were salt in my life. I would look at them and I would think, what is it about them? Everybody else could be panicking and they were resting in a peace that you couldn't explain. Everybody else was, was in worry and they had a word for the moment. And I, I kept asking uh, different ones, you know, there's there, there's... There's, there's somebody in our fellowship, and, and, and when I see them, it doesn't matter what they're going through. Their joy is unspeakable. Their peace passes all understanding. And, and I would get this response, well, you know, they're a little different. <laughs> there's a one or two in this room right now. They're a little different. <laughs> That's why we don't like to talk about the Holy Spirit because we attribute the talk, you know, we attribute the dealing with the Holy Spirit with weird people. Let, let me, come here. They're weird with or without the Holy Spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? Listen, I, I know, I, I, I know, I know some of the greatest UT ball fans in the world. They're weird. <laughs> it, 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 even if we didn't have a ball team, they're still weird. You understand what I'm saying? It has nothing to do with the balls. They're just weird. If you want to get really weird, go to Florida and meet some Gator fans. <laughs> they're really weird. So I, I, started, I started hearing this name that, uh, of a man who had already passed away uh, before I even came to Christ. I kept hearing this common denominator in, in, in these people's lives. They had been disciples of a group of, of individuals, but specifically this name would always kind of rise to the top of the conversation. His name was Manly Beasley. I mean, that name alone is a little bit weird. 
And, it, and, and so I would, I would ask people, hey, what is this guy, Manly Beasley? Manly Beasley was a Southern Baptist evangelist that was, uh, in his early days, he was uh, tall, good-looking, uh, debonair, had an incredible oratory capacity. He had a command of the English language that was phenomenal. And somewhere along in his ministry, um, he was afflicted. Uh, he began to get sick, and as medical records would show, in his body at, any, at, at one given point, he had seven diseases, two of which would not be diagnosed until, until uh, almost his death. Um, he, he, his body was bent. Um, he was in miserable condition. But Manly Beasley said, having passed from a tall, debonair, uh, gifted orator out of his sickness, out of dealing with those seven debilitating diseases that should have killed any man, he lived for years in that sickness, and he said that it was in his brokenness that God blessed him, but in his arrogance, God could not use him. So out of his life, he developed um, this component. He began to study faith. God, how am I supposed to live debilitated, agonizing? There's no medicine to relieve my pain. There's no treatment to cure my diseases. Oftentimes, he was so physically sick that they would have to fix him in a special pulpit where he would stand and preach the word of God with such anointing and power out of his weakness, sickness, and brokenness that, that it, it, quite literally hundreds would come to Jesus Christ out of this frail, broken, diseased body. And someone said to Manly, Manly, you preach so much on faith. Why don't you pray for God to heal you? And he said, because it's in my sickness that I know him the most. And if he healed me, I wouldn't need him like I need him. See, we oftentimes blame stuff on, on the devil that God has by design brought into our life to push us into a place we would not have otherwise trusted him. So Manly, when, when he would talk about faith, he's, he says it's like an Ecclesiastes 4.12, a three-bound cord. Are you still with me? Yeah. All right, he would say it this way. Now, I'm going to say the Jeffrey Thomas way because it resonates a little bit easier with me. It's a little more contemporary. He, he would say it this way. He would say there's, there's a three-bound cord of faith that sets the saved average believer apart from the victorious life of, of a believer that's walking by faith. He would say, number one, uh, that uh, faith is intellectual. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Some of this is rehearsal for you that have been with me, but for some, this is new. It's intellectual. This is believing God can do a thing. He said, not only is faith intellectual, that's, uh, that's I just wrote out the word believing, and I'm going to tell you why in a moment. He said, faith is also emotional. That's wanting God to do a thing. When, when you decide you want God to do it at any cost and at any loss, now the Holy Spirit's ready to to do, to do business. That makes sense to you? See, we don't resonate with this because we start counting what we're going to have to let go of. But I promise you something, anything he takes away, I promise you whatever he puts in its place is going to be better than you could ever think, hope, or imagine. I promise you that. He's a good, good father. It, um, uh, faith is intellectual. That's believing God can do a thing. Faith is emotional. That's wanting God to do a thing. And then lastly, this is a word we don't use very much. He said faith is volitional. That's acting as if God has already done the thing. Now, when you ask Manly Beasley, well, Manly, what, what was faith in your life? How did, you, how did you live this incredible life of sickness, but at the same time anointing, in poverty, but you had abundance? How, how did that happen? He, this is how uh, uh, Manly Beasley would say it. He said, faith is acting as though a thing is so when it's not so in order for it to be so because God said it so. Amen. <laughs> well, just sit there. <laughs> All right, let's do it one more time. Faith is acting as though a thing is so when it's not so in order for it to be so because God said it so. Now, listen to me. This is the natural response to that. Oh, that's that name it and claim it stuff right there. That's that blab it and grab it. No, it's not. No, no, it's not. Now, I want you to write these three words down. Believing, believing, wanting, walking. Now, that's how, that's how it resonated with me. So I want you to go back to Mark chapter uh, 5, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to lay out for you how these components in faith. Now, why do we need faith? This, this is why faith is essential. I have had, I've had folks ask me, why don't you, why don't y'all just borrow the money? You're a growing church. You're, you're, you're meeting an exceeding budget. 
you know, you got, a, you got a, over a million dollars in the, in, the, in the property fund. Why don't y'all just borrow the money and build the building? Here, here's my primary concern. It's not the debt. It, 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 it set all that aside, which I'm not crazy about. I don't want to go into a bunch of debt because then you end up paying the mortgage instead of funding the ministry. But that's a, second, that, that's a secondary issue. Here's, here's what I think really in the heart of this church is. We, we are growing, and, and I understand that. We, in fact, we're growing in July which is financially and uh, uh, numerically the weakest month of the year in church calendar. And we are growing. We, we are seeing people get saved. We're seeing people bab- follow the Lord and believers' baptism. We, listen, we, we've got so many young families. It's like bunny rabbits down there in the nursery. Do you understand what I'm saying? They are multiplying. It's unbelievable what God's doing. And you know what that is? That's just God honoring his church when we said we want your man, not our man. We want you to send your pastor to lead and love our children. And by faith, listen, that thing's already exploding. Why not just go to Tazewell? Because I don't believe the issue's the, the building. I think, I think the issue is God building the faith before he gives us the facility. Because American Christianity gets fixated on a facility. They get fixated on the carpet and the pews and the parking lot and the programs. Listen, these are the last moments of the last days. This is not the hour to be thinking about prissy facilities. Now, now listen, we want to build something to the glory of God. I understand that. But listen to me. What we want God to do by faith is turn this city upside down. We want God to send the Holy Ghost winds of revival in such a way that the attic gets set free, the home gets healed, the heart gets saved. I'm telling you, listen, we, we... We want God to do it, but uh, he can't do it until he develops faith in the heart of the people. It's not about the building on Tazewell. It's about the body that he's developing. What good would it do if somebody wrote the multi-million dollar check today to build everything we need down there, but we go without the faith to operate when we're there? It's no good. So, So when you look at the unfolding of faith, it's believing, it's wanting, it's walking. Now, let me show you in the text. If you're still with me, say amen. Look at chapter 5 of Mark, verse 25. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. Just right in your margin right there, Obamacare. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Not going to have a seating problem long. Eat that up. <laughs> <laughs> you should see my wife right now. <laughs> uh, she had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was none the better but grew worse. You ever, you ever, you ever trusted God and grew worse? I mean, you're in, a, you're in a mess because you believe God. Let me give you a biblical example. We will not bend, we will not bow, and if we have to burn, we will. It's in the Bible. If you read it, we'd be out of here 30 minutes earlier. It's called the book of Daniel. And those three boys, they're on the plain of Shinar. We're not talking about East Tennessee where they might be standing up and they might not be standing up. Somebody asked me why I love living here. Well, one reason is I'm taller depending on where I'm standing. (laughs) We're We're talking about the plain of Shinar by the thousands Everybody bows down to the image except these three Hebrew boys. And, 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 and listen, they're about to be put in the furnace because they obeyed God. Yeah. They, it grew worse. But I love what they said. You know what, Neb? Now listen, Neb, I'm just going to tell you. Our God's able to deliver us, but if not, yeah. but if he chooses for some reason not to deliver us from the fiery furnace, we're still not going to bend bow. And you don't know it yet, but we ain't even going to burn. <laughs> Now watch this, she grew worse, she grew worse, she grew worse. That's what it says. There's times when you wonder, where in the world is God? What's he doing? What's he doing? Why can I not hear from God? This thing's getting worse. I'm I'm fasting, I'm praying, I'm believing. I'm doing everything that he called me to do. And I'm in worse shape than I was when I started following God. Did y'all hear about the German shepherd and the Doberman pincher that was sitting at the table enjoying a cup of coffee? Did y'all hear about that? German shepherd looks around and says, I want y'all to know something God said to me. Just the other day, God said to me, I am the most beautiful. I am the most fierce, loyal dog ever made. I am the grandest of all God's creations. The Doberman, he snarled and he said, well, that's a lie. 
He said, I want you to know just this morning, God told me I was the sleekest, meanest, most loyal, fiercest animal he's ever created. On the other side of the table, a cat was sitting there, and the cat said, I didn't say any of that. <laughs> I just needed y'all to come back. That's all I... Verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, if I only may touch his clothes, this is his prayer shawl. You know, the English translation does great service, disservice. This is not the hem of, of his coat. This is his prayer shawl. This is his talit. It's his sanctuary. It's got, it's, it, anyway, in, in, in verse, verse, verse 30, and immediately Jesus, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Now, now remember, I'm believing, I'm wanting, and I'm walking. I need God to do something in my life. I got a stronghold. I got an addiction. I got a seduction. I got deception. I need God to do something in my life because when I open up the word, preacher, I'm telling you, it is absolute nothing. I mean, the heavens are brass. The, the Bible is boring. I need God to do something inside of my heart, my home, my marriage. I need God to speak to me. Okay, here we go. No, no, number one's got to be believing. Yeah. You, you, you got to start with faith. That's synonymous. Now, now, how do you know that? Watch, watch, watch what she said. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood and had suffered many things of many physicians, spent all she had, was none the better. That, that's the wanting component. You ever want God to just do something? I mean wanting to do something. It's okay to want God to do something. You have a good, good father, and he'll withhold no good gift from you. It's okay to say to God, God, I, 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 I really want you to do this. Now, we're going to talk about that in just a moment, how that comes in line with his word. So, so there's the emotional or the wanting component. And when she heard of Jesus, that's the believing. How did she hear? Because it was being noised abroad. Do you know that God is so sovereign that he has decided that he's going to wait on us. When he could have written it in the heavens, he could have sent the angels to announce it. He could have, he could have worked every kind of mind-blowing miracle you can imagine over East Tennessee to draw the world to him. But here's what he decided to do. He said, I'm going to take a bunch of ragtag sinners. I'm going to save them from themselves. I'm going to seal them by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to gift them through the Holy Spirit. And then I'm going to send them out in such a way that when the world sees them, they will ask for a reason that with a hope that's within them, I'm going to, I'm going to literally send the Bible out into the highways and the hedges so that when they hear about what I've done in them, those who don't know me will ask them how in the world this happened and we'll say it didn't happen because of us, it happened because of him. Right? So, I, I, so there, there's a wanting component. She wanted him to heal. There's a believing component. When she heard, now she has got to make a decision and this is exactly where some of us are today in our lives. She's got to make a decision at this moment. Religion says if she reaches out and touches him, she's, she's under the penalty of death. According to Levitical principle, she has an issue of blood and she is unclean. She cannot hold her husband, hug her children. She cannot go to worship. For 12 years, she's been isolated. From, she, she, for, for 12 years, she's been practicing social distancing. Now, if I touch him, he's a holy man. Under the penalty of death, I could be drug out of this city and killed. Just got to make a decision. That's where some of us are this morning. You're going to have to decide, are you going to listen to the law or are you going to listen to the spirit? You're going to listen to religion that nullifies the word of God? You hear me. Listen to this preacher. This is the last thing I ever get to say to you. You hear me. There is this erroneous idea going around that somehow or another, the Son of God, the Word of God, came and dwelt among us to speak to us, and then the Holy Spirit of God bore men along and, and wrote down 66 infallible, inerrant, authoritative books of the Bible, and there, is, there are goober gumps standing in pulpits today called pastors who will tell you God does not speak anymore. I'd like to ask you something. If he abandoned heaven to come through the womb of a virgin, the word of God, and he framed our world with his word, and he gave us a word, then what do you think he wants to do other than speak to us? I, I, there's a believing component. There's a wanting component. Now watch it. There's a walking component. Now let's, let's, let's put some flesh on this, and let's go, let's go to the house. Now, what, what's, what's the believing component? Here, here's, how it, here's how it works out. First and foremost, 
I got to get in the word to get a word. If I pray anything according to his word and his will, I have, I, listen to me, regardless of what you've done, preacher, you can't imagine how bad I've been. In fact, I can't believe the building didn't fall down when I came in. Listen to me. If it didn't fall when I got here, it is secure. You understand what I'm saying? You can't believe how bad I've been. It doesn't matter. The blood paid it all. It paid it all. It paid every sin you've ever done. It paid every sin you'll ever do at the cross of Calvary. Therefore, you're going to have to make a decision. Only growing worse. I walked an aisle. I signed a card. I prayed a prayer. I got in the baptistry. I joined the church. But the problem is it's only getting worse. That's right. Because you did in the natural what you would not do in the supernatural. You didn't just join the building. You got to be grafted into the body. You got to submit and say, Father, I'm a sinner. I deserve hell, but by the grace of God, I'd like to today declare that this sinner accepts the blood atonement of Jesus Christ and in that moment there's a transaction in heaven that seals your fate. It's a believing component. You're you're never going to be able to walk by faith because faith comes by and hearing by. Okay, so you you got to get in the word to get a word. Now what does that mean? That's not name it and claim it. That's read it and believe it. So that when when you are processing the word, you could have read that passage a hundred times before. But this time, something is profoundly different. This time, it leaps up off that page and sets down in your spirit and the spirit of the living God. I remember when our daughter was diagnosed with cancer and we were told, we were told specifically on the medical. I'm 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 not arguing with the medical. They can only do what they can do. But you hear me. They don't have the last word. They don't have the final word. So we went to the word. And I remember very specifically when she she was suffering from a cancer that radiation would not remove, cancer would not kill, uh, chemo wouldn't kill, I, I, and, they, and, and we got all the layout of that. I, I, I want you to hear me. We went to the Word looking for a Word, and we got a Word from the Word that said, this sickness shall not be unto death. I want you to understand something. We didn't name it and claim it. We just held on to the blessed promise that our Father in Heaven knew exactly what we were going through, and as we traversed those days of cancer, we rested upon the Word of God. We thank God for the medical. We bless God for the doctors but there was a great physician in heaven who had given us a word from the word and in believing that word we just kept pressing in that this baby girl was not going to suffer death not at least at that moment because there was a word from the word of God the average believer don't spend enough time in the word to get a word and then we end up blaming stuff on God that God never did he never said it It, it, you, you got emotional but you didn't get biblical So there's a believing component. Uh, Will I believe the word of God? And here's the secondary component, the wanting component. Do I want God to do it? There are times in my life, as much as this may disappoint you, when God will speak to me and say, I want to do this. But the Jeff in me won't let the Jesus in me have the authority to do what he wants to do. Y'all some holy people. I'm glad y'all never had that problem. For a long time in my Christian walk, I, I, would, I, would, I would read that Psalm 37, verse uh, 4 and 5, that says, if I delight myself in the Lord, he will give me the desires of my heart. Well, for a long time in my ignorance, I just I read it this way. Lord, I'm going to do what you want me to do, and when I've done what you want me to do, I need you to do what I want you to do. Y'all ever been there? Until one day, specifically out of the teaching of Manly Beasley, the Holy Spirit said to me, Jeff, you're not even smart enough to know what you want. If I gave you what you wanted, you wouldn't want it three days from now because you don't even have enough sense to know that's not going to help you. So I said, well, Lord, what in the world does this verse mean? It says if I delight myself in you, you give me what I want. He said, no, it's not. If you delight yourself in me, I'll give you the right want to want so that when you get what you got, you'll want what you got because I know better to give you what you need than you know what you need. You, you, You with me? It, it, that's the component of faith. It operates in a, in a place where I simply, by believing the word of God, that, in, that my wanter, my wanter is submitted to him. Father, what do you want for our lives? I, there have been times when I've gotten out of the will of God and out of the will of God, I, I, I think, what, wait a minute, I made a logical, financial, reasonable, rational, no, no sin. How did I get in this mess? Because I gave you what you wanted. And I didn't give you what I wanted for you because if you had what I wanted for you, you wouldn't be in this mess. So it's a believing component. 
It's, it's, it's the wanting component. Now, here's, here's what he calls volitional. I, call, I just simply say it this way. It's the walking component. Go, go over to Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 18, and we end there. Proverbs chapter 4, a very practical, beautiful truth. Uh, this is a lot of rehearsal for, for most of you in the faith. Go to Proverbs. It's in the, uh, if you're new to the faith, it's in the Old Testament. If you get to Genesis, you've gone too far. Go to Proverbs chapter 4. I want you to look, if you would, at verse 18. So I, I, I'm believing the Word of God because I'm in the Word of God. Dad, I want to ask you a question. What, what's the Word of God over your family? Now, see, we're, we're not even allowed in some churches to talk like that because it's relegated to, to a charismatic theology. I want to say something to you right here. Listen to this preacher. The weakest minds in the world, the weakest minds in the church and in the pulpit will label you. They'll label you. Instead of, instead of being willing to, to labor with you and to get in the word with you, they'll label you. And they'll say, boy, he's a charismatic. No, I'm not, Goober. It's in the book. <laughs> Noah had a word for his family. And let me say something to you. Had he not obeyed that word, his boys and his daughter-in-laws would have died. You understand that? Elijah had a word from God. It will not rain according to the word of God until I say so. Now, who's he talking? Well, wait a minute. What kind of hubris, arrogant, charismatic, name it, claim it, black, uh, uh, you know, that prosperity. How in the world can he say? Because he was so in tune with God that he knew what he said was what God said and what God said is what he said and there wasn't any debate about it. He was saying what God had already said to him privately. What's the word of God over your family, Dad? Are you, what do you believe in God for in your family? Let me tell you what the average dad's believing. They're, they're believing for a scholarship to play football. And then when he's 40 and his knees are blown, his back is out, and he's mad at God because he's eating hydrocodones like Pez candy, you wonder why he can't get a word from God. Now, I'm not fussing at you, and I'm not saying athletics is not. I'm just telling you that you... There's something bigger and better than hauling a piece of pigskin down a, down a field. Y'all all right this morning? What do you believe in God for for your family? Do you know what brought me to this church? It was the stellar facility because it's so easily laid out. That's what it was. <laughs> My wife and I, I couldn't get a word from God. I couldn't get a word from God. And I was in the honey hole. I'm, I'm telling you, I was in, uh, we were about the happiest we'd been in a long time. I mean, it was absolutely on like Donkey Kong. And I couldn't get a word from God. And God said, you're not going to get a word till you go to the property. You've got to step on the facility before I will speak to you about this. So I called Mike Ward and I said, we're coming back from West Tennessee. It was Thanksgiving and I need to be on the property. And really, I said to my family, uh, we're leaving our family early to come by here so I can tell them no, and they can go, and I can, we can go back to where we were because we were in the middle of a move of God. And so we, I, I told my wife, I said, when I get on the property, I'll have, I'll have a word from God. God's told me that. I got a word that he'll give me a word when we get on the property. I need to tour the building. I need to feel it. I need, I need to touch this thing. <laughs> About 20 minutes into the tour, I said to my wife, I don't think we're even in Tennessee anymore. We've gone through another dimension. If we take one more right and a left down a set of stairs seven miles from Knoxville, we've ended up in a netherworld. We lost our children in the tour. We came back two weeks later. They were wandering the halls. <laughs> do, do, you know, do, you know, do you know what brought me here? After I toured the facility, I was in the word of God and, and God spoke to me and he told me a very, I mean, by name. Now, I don't care how you feel about that. My father's very specific. He does not play hide and go seek. He said, you need to call this individual. I called this pastor who's, who's world, he's known all over the world. By the grace of God, I got through to him because he's not a friend of mine. I don't know him personally. By the grace of God, I got through to him. And I said to him, this is my dilemma. And I, I've toured it and I can't get released from it. And this is what he said. He said, Jeff, I know your ministry. And he said, you've always had a word of revival on your life. Everywhere you go, revival. He said, now I've also heard rebellion <laughs> and riot. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Come on. <laughs> He said, uh, there is, there is, uh, out of a prayer movement that was birthed in the 90s, there is a move of God 
where pastors from multiple denominations were coming together under the burden and there is, a, there is a word from the word that in the last days a revival will sweep through the eastern part of the United States and the man that got the word from God on his deathbed, barely able to breathe, his body racked with, with cancer, called in his the multiple pastors. They held up a, a map. Most of you don't know what that is because you've got a phone. There's a map. There's a map of East Tennessee and he took his decrepit, cancer-ridden finger, his body, and pointed to North Knoxville and he said, gentlemen, before I die, the Holy Spirit of God has told me that in North Knoxville, there is a movement coming that will be so significant that it will touch the whole region and it will explode and follow the Appalachian, did I say that? Appalachian Mountains, it will go all the way down into Alabama, across Mississippi. Mississippi needs a revival. They will go into Mississippi, <laughs> and it will explode and touch this country. And he, and listen to me, in the moment that he said it, the moment that he said it, it absolutely resonated with my spirit. And, and that seven and a half years ago, believing God. Now, listen to me. Why would you, why would you believe God for something like that? Because I want to see God do something so big, the devil can't stop it. The world can't take credit for it. And when it's done, God gets the glory for it. And we get snatched up out of heaven right in the middle of the fields that are white under harvest. So it's believing it's wanting, it's walking. Now, now look, look, we're, we're out of time. Look at, look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. But the path of the just is like uh, the shining of the sun that shineth ever brighter unto the perfect day. Here, here we go. It's, it's processional. I'm saved by grace through faith. You, you listen to me, beloved. As a believer, you're not going to a spiritual McDonald's. I'd like to order a sack of sanctification. <laughs> and I need an extra I need a, I need some extra sauce of whatever. <laughs> I don't I don't know. Supersize it. <laughs> uh, please draw the window two, please. Window two. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not ready. Could you pull a slot C? <laughs> It's, it's, not, it's not drive through, pick it up on Sunday. Yeah. It's processional. Yeah. So that the, the word that I'm believing God for now, it's... It, <laughs> hi, Brother Mike. Go back in there and finish your cigarette. We'll be, we'll be done in just a minute. <laughs> finish your cigarette. We'll <laughs> you know, it's amazing anybody comes to this church. I kid you not, we had a beautiful young family. I mean, we don't really have any ugly ones, but we, we had a beautiful young family that came down and introduced themselves today. I mean, they were just a joy to meet. And uh, I immediately knew they were not from here because they had a, up north, you know, they pronounced stuff differently. And but it just were a joy. And I said, what, how did you get here? They said, we just moved here. We, we had a friend that knew your ministry and we lived in the state of New York, and we just said, it's, it's time to go to Tennessee. They just packed their family up and moved here to be part. Can I get a witness over here with the bogs? <laughs> can can y'all believe God's doing this stuff? See, when I get a word, it, it, it may not come to pass immediately. It may be that God says, listen, I'm going to do it, but before I can do it for you, i got to do it in you. You understand that? You getting saved this morning is not every problem going away. It's not every addiction disappearing necessarily. I'm just telling you, if you believe God right now for this fact, that he so loved you that he, that he died for you, got up on the third day to live for you, I'm telling you, if you'll just take that first step. Yes. You, all the problems may not disappear the moment I believe I got the word. Yeah. But I'm telling you, it's not that God won't do it. It's that God's got to do it in me before I can get to see it. So that means my believing's got to be my wanting. Do I really want God to do it? Yeah. Then my walking. It's as the shining. It's, it, it, it's I got a word. And as I walk in it, I get more light as I obey the light I got. Yeah. 
So that what happens is the very faith that got me to believing and wanting has now got me walking. And the more I walk in what he said, the more I want what he said. And the more I want what he said, the more I walk in what he's got. And the more I walk in what he's got, the more I get to know him. And the more I get to know him, the more I get to trust him. So that at some point I can reach out and get a hold of him and the healing comes. That's all faith is. It's just that intimacy of believing what he said, wanting what he wants over what I want, walking in it daily so that progressively, progressively I become more like him and less like me. Now, here's the challenge. Next week we're going to give you, I'm going to give you the rest of this and because we're believing God for, for, uh, from starting next week going into the week of Thanksgiving. We're believing God for a miracle offering because we've got to live in this building until we... God tells us to go to Tazewell. So typically when you say that, the church, first thing they hear is money. Oh, my gosh. There's the money. Here we go. He set us up. Ethel, you're not going on that cruise. It goes your money right there. No, listen to me. Listen to me. It isn't about the money. It's about developing faith that can trust God with the money. Amen? Amen. So let me, let me share with you by application, practical application, how God taught me this. We, we were in West Tennessee. I was pastoring a church that, that literally, I, I mean, it was growing so fast that from Sunday to Sunday, we could not see the people. It, it just, I don't mean it just exploded numerically. I mean, God was absolutely doing a work that was unbelievable. And it started with my wife. She got saved about 3 o'clock in the morning in the parsonage. Amen. Now, can I tell you that Baptists frown on, <laughs> on a pastor's wife getting saved after you call him. <laughs> you tried on this side over here. But let me say it this way. It's important that your pastor's wife be saved. Do you all get that? So we'd had an intense moment of fellowship. <laughs> I just simply asked Pastor Richie. I asked my wife. I said, we, we were coming home from a fellowship. It's about 11 o'clock at night, I, and we were coming over the river bridge. I said to my wife, hey, how's your private praise and prayer time? She said, well, who are you to ask me that? I said, well, bless God, I'm your pastor, number one. And I just wondered, how, how's your private prayer? She said, let me tell you something. You're the one that was a heathen. You're the one dropped out of high school two times. I grew up a Baptist. I was traveling around on a big old bus singing about Jesus. You didn't even know Jesus. Who are you to ask me about my private praise and prayer time? Well, it got interesting. <laughs> About 1 o'clock in the morning, you know, we'd made a vow. We weren't going to let the sun go down on our anger. We stayed up all night. I was in the living room. She's in the bedroom. And I'm talking to God. God, I don't tell me what. I don't know what to do with this woman. I mean, all I asked about was her Bible study time. About 3 o'clock in the morning, she come walking down the hall. That parson is just sobbing. She said, let me tell you why I don't want you to ask about my private praise and prayer time because I was raised in the church around the things of God, and you got something, Jeff Laborg, I don't have. And I've prayed since we got married every Sunday, God, if I'm not saved, save me. God, if I'm not saved, save me. God, if I'm not saved, save me. And I'm tired of living like that. Now she's getting her wanter in line with God's word. We took off. In a, she said to me, she got saved that morning in the parsonage about 3.30, uh, pregnant with Bethany Lee. And she said, I don't know what we're going to do if I tell the church they'll fire us. I said, you know what? If they don't want to save pastor's wife, they can fire us. Let us go. I don't pastor on church like that anyway. Well, not only did I not get fired, it broke out in Holy Ghost, snot slinging, soul saving, pew jumping, hanky waving. It was on Amen. for weeks. Amen. We were growing so fast we couldn't pay the, you know, we couldn't pay the bills because all these new believers, they don't know how to tithe. Come on, y'all. New believers don't know how to tithe. I know some old ones don't either, but the new believers don't know how to tithe. So my, my, my financial officer called me and said, Preacher, I don't know how to tell you this. I was off preaching a, 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 a meeting. He said, Preacher, we're broke. He said, we're the biggest church in Hardin County, Tennessee, and we can't pay the bills. He said, we're in trouble. I said, like, okay, how much trouble? And what I really meant was, like, my check. <laughs> I can worry about anybody else. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to go penalize me. I'm just, I'm like, look, I got a kid. I'm like, like, I mean, we're going to cover my check, right? No, we, I mean, like, we can't turn the lights on. 
I said, oh, my gosh. Well, I had a little tape ministry. Right? I'd hawk my tapes at revivals just to get the gas money because some believers don't anyway. So I had this series of tapes on faith. I do not have them anymore. I burned them. I had this series of messages on faith. So I preached all week long, and I'd sold enough tapes, you know, to get, to, to get some gas money for the meeting and come home and buy some diapers. And at the end of the meeting, I had, I had these tapes left, and, and, the, and I'm standing back there praying, Lord, I need to sell all of these because I'm not getting paid this week. And the pastor, the host pastor, stands up in the pulpit. I'm walking down the aisle to go to the tape table. Praying, God, please sell these tapes. Please, in Jesus' name, their own faith. I have faith. He goes, I don't say. And the preacher announces, all of the tapes on Brother Jeff's table are free. <laughs> I thought, wait a minute. I could have swore. I stopped right in the middle of the aisle and looked back at him like, I wish God would kill you dead right now. <laughs> I know, I know you did not just say that. He said, I want everybody in here to get up, go back. You get anything on his table, it's free. I thought, well, that's great. My church is broke. I ain't getting paid this week. And this sucker just gave everything I had away. And he looked right out of the pulpit, and that's what he said to me. He said, they are on faith, right, Jeff? But you mind your own business. I mean, really, get out of my business. I said, yes, sir, they're on faith. I didn't even go to the table. They just cleaned me out. They cleaned me out like a Baptist at the buffet. I mean, Sunday wasn't nothing left. I'm standing back there so mad. He said, I guess you wonder why I gave all your stuff away. I said, well, yeah, I'll be honest with you. I am. He said, well, we got together this afternoon. This is a small country church running around 60, 65 at the most. He said, we got together, Jeff. We've been praying over your ministry. He said, we heard what God's doing down there in Savannah. And he said, I just want you to know the Holy Spirit of God told us that we need to sow into your ministry. And we felt like you just give them, you, you need to sow, so we're going to sow. And he handed me a check. Now watch this. He handed me a check for $15,000. So I get back to the church and I told my, my financial operator. I said, don't worry about my check. Don't worry about my check. I'm good. He said, preacher, it's not good. He said, I'm not kidding you. Everything's due. I said, well, what do you think we owe? He said, oh, I can take you to the dime. $14,995. Here's your check. I just gave it to him. I just handed it to him. Let me explain something to you. I, I wouldn't take a million dollars for what he taught me with a $15,000 check because when we learn how to start walking and wanting and believing, I'm not talking about name it and claim it. I'm talking about trust and obey. Something happened to our ministry that exploded intimately inside of us. So I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to give $15,000. I'm just asking you, what, what does he want so that he can give back that which money can't buy? Let's pray together.